Hello, my name is Lalandrea Bolander. I am 22 years old. Today's date is the 30th of September, 2015. We are in Sacramento, California, and I am here with Miss Tommy Whitlow. I am Tommy Whitlow. Today is September the 30th, 2015, in Sacramento, California, and I am here to talk about Golden Robinson Whitlow Landers, my mother, an unsung hero. Many people say that leaders are made. I am here to say that l parents instill and develop the foundation in children to become leaders. And I believe that that's what my mother did. She instilled integrity and honesty in us. She taught us to always acknowledge, acknowledge God in all of our ways. She taught us self-confidence. One of the ways that she taught us self-confidence, one year, and God only knows why, my mother purchased us some wedge shoes. That is me and my sister. No one else in the elementary school had wet shoes. In those days, it wasn't accustomed to wear wet shoes. And they were green, mint green, and a lighter green. And they were leather straps, and we wore them to school with socks. We didn't have a second pair of shoes that we could change into once we left home. So for one consecutive week, one week, we wore those shoes embarrassed, totally embarrassed. And we would go home and we would say, no one else is wearing these shoes but us. And she would say, I buy your clothes. And what do you care about what other children think? Those shoes keep you up from walking on the ground and nothing's wrong with them. After a whole week of complaining, we had a new pair of shoes the following Monday. Now, we had to this day do not know what, why she did that, but we do know that we learned that we were our own self-persons and that we were not to be overly concerned about what others thought of us. She taught us that if you only have one dress, you come home, you wash it, you iron it, and you wear it back the next day. You must be clean. You don't have to have a lot of money, but you do have to have integrity and you have to have honesty. And you must treat people fairly because if you treat people fairly, if you excel in life, you're going to see those same people again and they will be kind to you. If you mistreat people and you excel in life and something happens because that's the way life is and you lose your positions, they will not be kind to you. So those are some of the lessons learned. One of the other things that she taught us, sisters don't fight. When we disagreed with each other, we could never overtly fight. We learned the art of compromise early. And while we learned the art of compromise, we also learned to be self-confident in, 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 in whatever we said and what we did because we would say, well, we did it because so-and-so did it. She said, well, if so-and-so jumped off the Bay Bridge, you're going to jump off too? N I tell you, no. You don't do what other people do just because they do it. You, God gave you your mind, use it. You do what you know is right to do. Could you uh, paint me a picture of your mom? Okay. My mother, I thought, was a beautiful woman. She finished the freshman year in high school. She, she was an only child. She could have finished high school, but she chose to do other things. She was about 5'5". Five, five. She had two dimples. My sister has two dimples. I have no dimples. And I would go around sucking in my jaw, wanting to have dimples like them. She was shapely. I'm straight up and down. She was kind. She smiled. She was a beautician. Uh, so our hair always looked nice until I became 12 years old. And she told me I had to do it myself. And I looked horrible. Never was able to do my hair. Um, that, and she was a brown-skinned lady. And I don't remember my mother too much without gray hair. Mm. She was prematurely gray, but she always had it. It was always very pretty. 
And so when I became gray, I thought gray hair was pretty too. Uh, and I don't know if you get a picture. And, and she dressed very stylishly. Um, she called me by my full name, Tommy Ray. And when I hear Tommy Ray, I know that there are people from my past because no one calls me Tommy Ray anymore. I'm Tommy. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Um, my mother would say, God hates liars, and I do too. So we were always, that's where the integrity came in. Today, we do not knowingly lie. If we are not telling the whole truth, it's because we don't know it, because that's the way we grew up. We grew up to take the consequences of our behavior. If you were told to do something and you made the decision not to do what you were asked to do, you needed to tell the truth about it and accept the consequences of it. Those are the kinds of things that make a leader, and my mother did those for us. We had uh, dinner. We ate at the dinner table. Um, we would have to sit there, pass the peas, please. And if you didn't say please, we everyone just kept eating. Uh, you would have to say please. And if you got up from the table, you would say, may I be excused, please? My mother was very big on that. She did what she knew to make us better. And one of the things that she did, my grand, her mother and her stepfather were in Oakland, California, and she sent us to live with them because she said that we would get a better education in California than we would in Louisiana. She came later. But when we went to live with my grandmother, Robert, uh, grandparents Robert and Vassai Jackson, they had a very difficult time because my grandmother was always concerned about what the neighbors said. And we had grown up that we don't care what the neighbors said. Mama said it was okay. So that's all that counts. And it just, poor lady, you know, I think about how we treated my grandmother. How would you treat her? What was one of the times that she got upset? Well, she was concerned about, we did, I don't remember exactly what we did, but we did something, and she says, well, my God, you girls, the neighbors are going to talk about that. What, what are they going to say? What am I going to say? And we said, we called our grandmother Big Mama. We said, well, Big Mama, we did the right thing. We don't care what the neighbors think. She said, but then I said, Big Mama, Mama told us to not to be concerned about the neighbors if what we did was the right thing. And I really apologize. I don't know. I just remember you can feel it without really knowing what the incident itself was. And that's where I am with a lot of this, of remembering how I felt without remembering the issues. And, 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 and it's only in retrospect that I look back and think about my poor little grandmother being overly concerned about the neighbors, and we weren't. I do know one thing that happened. My youngest sister um, got pregnant after high school. And when my grandmother told me about it, I was living in uh, Pasadena. And she said, she's pregnant. And I said, and? She said, well, what are the neighbors going to think? I said, Big Mama. We don't care what the neighbors think. She's pregnant. We can't unpregnate her. So that's the end of it. And so she got over it. And how much longer until your mother came and joined you in California? Oh, it wasn't long at all. Um, she came less than a year. Less than a year she came. And she lived with us, and then she got married. And uh, we didn't go because we were teenage girls. We did, we did not go to live with her because she said she didn't know my stepfather and if he touched us inappropriately, she would have to kill him. So we stayed with my, my grandparents. Um, I mean, that was love. She loved us. And, you know, let me tell you a story that my mother did. My mother heard about a girl who was at Southern University who got pregnant in her senior year. Her parents would not take care of her child once the baby was delivered. My mother took that baby in, never received a penny, took care of the child. Her name was Cheryl Lynn. Took care of Cheryl Lynn until the mother graduated from college. She came and took the baby away, and that was the end of it. Nothing, no obligations, no anything. And that was really something. 
My mother was also the youth director of our church. So that meant that when other children didn't learn parts, we had to learn them. And we learned to stand up before crowds at six and seven year old, six and seven years of age and give speeches. So we grew up being leaders and being on stage and being important um, at a very young age. My mother sewed and made outfits for us, and we, all, we always dressed alike. My mother said, I dress you alike so you won't say that I like her better than you or you, her, her dress is prettier than yours. They're the same. What's one of the outfits you can remember? Okay, we always, we all, she always combed our hair to the side, put a Shirley Temple curls with a bow on it, and, 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 and in the back we had one. And we always had little dresses that had little ruffles around them and socks and patent leather shoes. White, we, we only wore white socks to church. We had church outfits, patent leather shoes, and we did not wear those wet shoes to church. We wore patent leather shoes and white socks to church. And what would your mother wear to church? My mother dressed, in those days, my mother would have her hair up with a, some braids going through, like kids are wearing dreads now. Well, they were braids that went up and she'd put little things in it and it was very pretty and she'd have on a suit. That's what I remember. And I do vaguely remember when the chemise was in, she had a chemise dress. But usually she wore a jacket and a blouse and a skirt. And she was always the talk of the church because she was pretty. She encouraged me to go to San Francisco State University I remember her, I, I worked part-time for the city of, San, of, of, of Oakland in their recreation department. And I remember not having money to buy my books for the semester. My mother took her bill money. Instead of paying a bill, she loaned me the money to buy a book. I never in life will forget that, that my having that book was more important than her paying her bill. That was that, that is imprinted in my head. And I did pay her back. But going backwards, I had to my mother stopped helping me make decisions at age twenty. I had to make a decision to work for I was working for the um Oakland Unified Do School District uh in the child care. And I had guaranteed three hours or four hours a day, rain or shine. And I, I had to make a decision whether I wanted to leave that and go to recreation part-time where I made more money an hour, but I only worked two days a week. And if it rained, I didn't work at all. <laughs> and I asked, I said, oh, Mom, what should I do? She said, listen, you make that decision. If I tell you what to do, and it's a good decision, that will be good. But if I tell you what to do and it doesn't work out, you will blame me. So I want you to make that decision of what you want to do. Well, in retrospect, I can't believe that I agonized for weeks over this. I was so upset that she wouldn't help me. But in retrospect, it was one of the best things I did. I learned to make a decision. I made a decision to go with the Recreation Department. And that was one of the best decisions that I made because the Oakland Recreation Department taught me how to work with children. They taught me low-organized low, low games. They taught me how to sing with children. They taught me how to play little sports games with children. They taught me drama. They taught me dance. They taught me arts and crafts. So they taught me a lot. And then they provided training in how to deal with teens in youth groups. So I learned an awful lot from them. In fact, many of the things that they taught me, I use today in my church when I work with children today, to this date. My mother taught us to be strong, but one of the things that she didn't teach us is how to be soft in decisions and taking stances. It was important that we know how to get through life because life was not easy. But I learned to smile because when you wear an Afro and you work in a corporate world, sometimes, and you're an African American, sometimes people look at you, you make a decision, and it's like a harsh thing. If you, when I learned to smile, it broke the harshness 
of the stances that I took. She taught us fairness. Um, she taught us to be careful of what we did and how we did it. What I am today is a result of Golden Landers, Golden Robinson Whitlow Landers. I can tell you a story. When I worked for the Pasadena Unified School District Department of Recreation, I took two bus loads of seniors to Las Vegas. And I was on a bus, and a little white lady said, mm, 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 you just think you're something, don't you? I said, thank Golden Landers for that. <laughs> Do you think when you were wearing your afro that it related back to those shoes, those wedges? No. <laughs> That's interesting. How did you how did you come up with that analogy? No, it, I it, you know it it you know what I did? I cannot believe this. I had my hair cut. I, my mother did my hair and it was real pretty. My grandmother said it was pretty. She never told me my hair was pretty. I went one day and had all of my hair cut off and wore an afro, and when I came home, again, that's one of the things that my grandmother would say, what are the neighbors going to say? She said, but your hair was so pretty. I said, Big Mama, you never told me my hair was pretty. It was my statement that I was African-American, and it was okay. I was, we weren't African-Americans then. We were black and proud, and that's, that was my statement, but she never told me that my hair was pretty before she adjusted to it. What are the, some of the things that you miss about your mom or your big mama? But my big mama, I miss the home cooking. I miss her supporting me in saying, when I worked for Cigna, I lived in Brea, California. I, I worked in Brea and I lived in uh, Laverne. My grandmother would call me or we would talk. And she would say, I got the telephone right here to talk to you. And if, and if we didn't, if I didn't call her, she would say, you didn't call me, but I had the telephone there. They told all of their friends that I called her and talked to her. She, when, when I would go back to Oakland, she would say, now, what do you want? What do you want to eat? And I went back for Mother's Day every year, and that was her weekend. I never visited my friends or did anything with them that was for her. And I do miss running in and out of her house. We had the same telephone number. We had stability. And that was, we didn't know how important that is when we were growing up. But when we look at how people talk about African-American and African-American families, we had the best of all things. We were poor and didn't know it. My, we were we were poor. My grandfather was very proud. We would not he would not accept any help or any handouts. He was a common laborer, but that's what he did, and he was proud of it. And I just miss uh, I just miss knowing that she's there. And as far as my mother's concerned, when I went to I had an opportunity to go to Abidjan, Ivory Coast with Diane Feinstein when she made, uh, she was mayor of San Francisco at the time, and she made uh, Abidjan the first African sister city to San Francisco. My mother was very ill. She died after I got back. But her only thing she could say to me, she said, don't go over there and get married. You come back. <laughs> I didn't get married. I came back. I went, as soon as I got back to the States, I rushed over to see her. She was still there, and I was real happy she was there. She loved us. She's the smiles, um, knowing it's really knowing she's there, that you can run home. I always this is what happened to me. I always knew I had a home that was mine that I could go to. If I didn't like what I was doing, I could go home. When my grandmother died, I had a, I didn't have a home anymore, because they raised us and it was her house that we lived in, ten twenty two twenty eighth Street, Oakland, California. Um, it, it was no I had no home. So it made me grow up in a different way that wherever I am, that's my home. I'm gonna, I mean, I've, I've been an adult a long time. It's just that I still had a home to go to, and I no longer have a home to go to. One of the things that we do, because my mother gave so much to us, 
where much is given, much is required. And I give. My mother gave in the youth department. She gave to lots of young people. You know, that's only one, the young girl, that was the most dramatic of all of the things that she did. She did, when she got married, her stepdaughter didn't have any skills. So she insisted that she had to go to business school. And she paid for her to go to business school so that she could be marketable, so she could get a job. She encouraged us to go to college, and she encouraged us to, um, she encouraged me to pledge a sorority because she said, you'll have friends no matter where you go, always have someone if you belong to a sorority. And I did, and when we went through Hell Week, I said, yeah, I don't know if I want to do this. I can't do all this. She said, oh, oh, yes, you can. You can do that. And, you know, she smiled and said, oh, yes, you can. I don't know if I, yes, you can. You can do that. And I, sur I survived it. And what sorority are you a part of? Zeta Phi Beta sorority. One of the things that I do that I'm proud of in Sacramento, I am currently the president of the Sacramento Valley Section, National Council of Negro Women. I work with young scholars at Calvary Christian Center, community, it's like Calvary Christian Center Church at the 730 service in Children's Church. We have a core group of about five children who come every Sunday. And it's as big as 15 or 20, but five on a regular basis. And we have them write what they learn the month before. Like we spent a whole month, for example, we did the fruits of the spirit. And there are nine fruits, and for each month we spent one month on each fruit. And then the first Sunday of the next month, they wrote what they learned. Then we took everything they had done, took it to the Sacramento Library, I Street Press, and created a book. So they are authors. We had some brain damaged children in there, and they whatever they wrote, I put it in there. So even they are authors as well. So they now have two books working on the third. Well, actually, they're working on the fourth. The third hasn't been published yet. We don't know where people are that will create a learning experience and trigger their minds, oh, I can do this. So we'd use the, we use the medium of the written word that they, they learn, we talk, they, we have drama, they act out the scripture, because this is church. They act out the scripture, and then they have to write about it. And what inspired you to start this work? Was it your mother's work in the youth council at her church? She didn't do what I do, but it, it's, it's, it's the thing that she's the role model that I'm following, that I have followed. It's her legacy that I'm making alive, taking it to, to the next level. The fact that she worked with that young girl who was pregnant, I thought the world should know about that, and they never knew. Since then, when I worked in Pasadena, we, uh, we, that's when I started writing. The children on, on the playgrounds wrote why my mother should be the mother of the year. And then we had breakfast to create a, I got people to judge the contest to have a winner. And the parents came. It was really, really nice. We did that for several years. I've done it in churches because no one ever recognized my mother. And I wanted mothers to be recognized. I did it when I worked with the missionettes at Calvary Christian Center. We worked where we had girls who would get up every, every we went Wednesday nights every Wednesday and say, when I grow up, I'm going to be, and they had to finish that. And then when we would have badge ceremonies, whatever they said they were going to be, when their name was listed on the program, that's what was behind it. If they were going to be an, a doctor, an MD, MD was behind their name. If they were going to be a scientist, Ph.D. was behind their name, choreographer, whatever it was, we put it behind their names, and they got to see their names in print. We did a hula hoop contest at one of the housing projects here in Sacramento, and I gave all of the children, if the people gave me their names, a certificate. And because I know that in many of our homes we don't have frames to put the certificates in, I did cardstock. This little boy came up and said, he saw his name, he said, this is my name. I have never had one of these before. He was not an achiever, so he never got recognized. So that was the first time we did the hula hoop contest. So you can believe that every time we do one, if they give me the names, the names are listed so the children, no one has an excuse that I never had before. You can have one.
Can you tell me a little bit more about why you think recognition is important? Positive recognition is important because if you never get it, you never know. If, if you aren't being taught your worth, you're, you sit back, drawn, drawn down, you don't know who you are. You, nobody likes you. Nobody says any. If, you don't, if you're not excelling in school or if your hair is not combed and your nose is snotty, you, you sit at the back of the room and no one recognizes you. You might be smart, but you're afraid to answer because you know you're different than the rest of the children. Bringing that out of you can bring you out and help you show what you're worth and reach your potential. All of us have some greatness in us. It just needs to be brought out. And if giving a certificate will bring it out, that's fine. And that's a that's really, really small thing to do. But I didn't, listen, I didn't know about that until that child came up to me and told me. Hmm. And when he told me, you can believe every time we go to a housing complex and do something, we have certificates. Did your mother have any uh, family traditions or did Big Mama have any family traditions? The only family traditions we had is that was Christmas and, New and, and Thanksgiving. Um, we, she, we always had a big, th my grandmother was an excellent cook. My grandmother didn't know how to cook a little. When, uh, when she, when my, before my grandfather settled down or before they came to California, my grandfather worked in a, in a log and it's some kind of something where my grandmother cooked for lots of men. And so she didn't know how to, there was, my grandmother, there were there was five of us, six with my, her brother, my aunt, great uncle. She didn't know how to cook just for us. We never ate all of the food. We always had leftovers, and we always had dessert in the house. People could come by, and my grandmother's name is Vasti. People say Vasti, but she pronounced it Vasti. They could have sweet potato pie. They could have bread pudding. You know, I got tired of bread pudding, but today I love bread pudding, and I cannot make it as good as she can. I can make some, but not as good as my grandmother could. Uh, she made sweet potato pie. I don't even try with sweet potato pies. <laughs> did they? Did either one of them have catchphrases? I remember earlier you said, uh, God hates liars, mm -hmm. and so do I. Did she have any other sayings like that that you can oh, remember? Oh, yes. Both of them would say, Birds of a feather flock together. And that was always when they didn't want us to be with someone. <laughs> and I would hate that saying because whomever I was, I thought I was a very good judge of character. And, and most of the time I was. My grandmother just didn't. I didn't think my grandmother understood. I think, still think she didn't understand. But she would say, birds of a feather flock together. If they were doing something, if they're this way, you're hanging out with them, you're the same way. And do you know what? I say the same thing to children today. <laughs> it's funny how that happens. Isn't it? Birds <laughs> of a feather flock together. So what inspired you to start the National Council of Negro Women in Sacramento? Oh, I didn't start it. Betty O. Williams started it in Sacramento in uh, 1972. I am just a member. And so what, is, what do you do? What does that involve, your okay. work with them? In, with the National Council Sacramento Valley section, one of the things that I've been successful in doing, I've been in it about 20 years. Um, we, I've started the Christian Women of the Year. That was the first thing I started. Um, we do the Children of Promise, which is a program that looks at parents. And we said that based on the way I was raised, that the primary caregivers of children are the first role models, and they determine the cultural ebb of the children. So if we are, as African Americans, 6%, is it 6 percent of the population of the state of California, and our prison rate of the African-American men, it's almost 30 percent of the population. There's something wrong with those figures, Des desperately wrong. So we decided to do the Children of Promise Conference to work with parents. We call children who may be going to prison Children of Promise. 
We weren't going to call them what they were, but what we want them to be. So we offer lifestyle skills to parents to raise children, to give them to the world, to be world changers. And that's a direct from how my mother wanted us to be. Um, we also have a program that we do uh, foster care. Um, that's working with foster parents. And we, in fact, we give foster parents, we were able successful to give foster parents credit for working with the Children of Promise. But the National Council of Negro Women provides you an opportunity to develop your leadership skills and to influence people and to make a difference. I work with children, and I asked them last Sunday, what differences do you make in your community? What do you want to make in the world? They couldn't understand the world. I said, okay, in your family, you tell me you're going to be this. So how is that going to make a difference? So my mother made a difference in my life and the people in my sphere of influence because of me. They're influenced some kind of way, and I'm influenced by them as well. My job is to work to make sure that the generation that I influence is better than I was and to offer opportunities that I didn't have or at least show the way for opportunities that I didn't have. And when I think of children today and what the world would be like when they're older, I can't even think about it because I think about the cell phones. I'm going, what will they have then? Because my grandniece and nephew aren't going to know what a typewriter is. They aren't going to even know what a dial-up phone is. What's going to be? What will it be? And I need all children to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. How would you like your mother to be remembered? I would like my mother to be remembered as a woman who loved her children, cared about the community, cared about young people. And not only did she care about young people, she made sacrifices for young people to complete their journeys or to obtain their destiny or their goals so that they could be fulfilled in life. I hope she was fulfilled. And how would you like to be remembered, Tommy? I would like to be remembered as a person who offered resources to people to be, to know what the best is and be the best. Because many times people say to be the best. Well, I don't know what your best is. And I may not like your best. And your best may not be best. I, do, I deal with children with that on Sunday mornings all the time. You can be, you're better than this. So I want them to, first, I really want them to know who they are. I want them to know the resources that are available to them. And I want them to reach for those, aim for those resources, aim, set goals early. That's why we get up and say, when I, we still do that on Sunday mornings. I'm, I'm not in, in missionettes anymore. I'm in children's church on Sunday mornings. And they get to say what they're going to be when they grow up. And if they change every week, I don't care but they're thinking about what they're going to be when they grow up. And I'm hoping that their parents are buying books or, and then creating avenues for them to do that. I had one little boy who wanted to be a Navy SEAL. He said that, he, I got him when he was six. He said that ever since then, and now he's freshman in high school. His mother in the summers are sending him to naval programs. See, that's the way it's supposed to work. I have a little girl who was in the third grade said, I'm going to be a doctor. And because we put her, Dr. Belcher, on our program, she hung that on her door. She is now Dr. Shanye Belcher. And that's what it's about. It's about creating spaces, creating opportunities, creating thoughts. I haven't done any opportunities, just the thought that children can, you can do this, you can be this, and you go after it. And working with parents to make it, to make it happen for them. That's, that's what life is about. And when you look at that and you look back at the fact that there's a little girl in medical school right now, her, when she graduated from Stanford, her mother invited me to the graduation party because she said she's in Stanford because she was in your program. 
that's not really true. Her mother is a nurse. Her father is a doctor, a pediatrician. So she had the upbringing. It was just the nurturing and the, and the reinforcing what the parents did that we did. But they want me to be there, so I go. And now they're saying, well, you know, she's getting married, and we want you to be there because, you know, you were one of the ones. They even had her kindergarten teacher there. Hmm. So when you do that, some people care. And even if they don't care, if the children succeed and excel in life, that's what's important, that the next generation is safe for me to be an old lady in it. So we just have a few minutes left, Tommy. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, I just want to reiterate that Golden Robinson Whitlow Landers was never recognized for the things that she did for people. And I am sure there are things that she did that I don't know about and will never know. But she did them, and she never was paid for anything. She was not paid for the things, the fish fries that she had, taking children here, doing this. She was never paid, but she did them, and she never complained. And she loved us, and part of that was imparted to us, and at least to me, I take ownership for mine. And I just wanted the world to know, Golden Robinson Whitlow Landers, my mother. Thank you. You're welcome.